is the ways of death. God said, I've got no pleasure in the death of the sinner, but that he would turn to me. The prophet said in the Old Testament, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be come as white as snow. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that was lost. Do you realize how important your life is to God? I was sharing with the young people on Friday night, you know. My daughter, our daughter Monica, she's in full-time ministry and, uh, and I led her to Christ when she was three and a half years old. And, and then she went to Bible college and went to do some further studies. And, and now she's working with students at Simon Fraser University and, and trying to lead these students to Christ. And, and it's an amazing thing. Three years ago, she led a Chinese student to Christ. And, and when the student got wonderfully saved, the student went back to China and her mom and dad were Buddhists and she got a bunch of people together in her house and, and uh, there were about 30 or more people in that house and this Chinese girl, uh, her name was Lisa, not her Chinese name, but her name was Lisa. And Lisa got up amongst all these people and said, I want to tell you how Monica Detroit led me to Jesus Christ. And she told them how she got saved and 29 people got saved. Amen. Mm. Last year, Monica and her fiancé was in China. They've got an underground church now. And so Monica is, you know, just kind of dear and precious to me. And one night she phoned me just before Christmas. She, she said, Papa, and I said, yeah. She said, I'm sitting with all these foreign students that I'm working with, you know, Taiwanese and Chinese, and I speak amongst the Chinese. They can't say my name. And they say, what, what will we call you? I just said, call me Sam Wong. You know, I mean, you know, it's Chinese. And, and then she got in touch and she said, Papa, we've got all these foreign students. And, and she said, many are not Christians, some are. And she said, they can't go back to home. It's too far. And, and she said, what do we do? And God has given us this beautiful house. And we have a whole basement, which is my, my library. And, uh, and I said, uh, I know, I said, uh, what do you think? She said, well, what do you and mom think? I know it's Christmas. I said, bring them along. Mm. <coughs> and Christmas Eve, our house was full of students. Mm -hmm. Lovely students. <laughs> and so we were talking and playing games and all kinds of things. And, and then there was a moment of quietness. And Monica turned to me and she said, Papa. And I said, yeah. And she said, would you speak to us about Christ? Mm. So I began to share with them about Christ because the next day was Christmas. Mm. And they just sat there and they were listening, you know. You know, we still need to be in touch with God. Oh, brother and sister. You know, when Jesus said the words that I say unto you, they are spirit of our life. We really need to walk with God, you know. I mean. I was just sharing my heart with these students and I made two statements. The first was, your life is so important to God. That if you were the only person on this planet, Jesus Christ so deeply loves you. That God would have still send his son just to die for you on the cross. And, mm. and that's how I was sharing. I made another statement that I've made already. And I said to these students, I said, listen here. Jesus said, as my father sent me, so do I send you. It's going to cost you more to miss the will of God for your life. And it's going to cost you to find it. And, and amongst those students was a Taiwanese girl with the name of Lula. Oh, she was smart. She was finishing her master's degree. And she wasn't a Christian. And, I sent him to bed in the basement and sleeping on the floor and mattresses and all these kids and Monica and 7 o'clock the next morning I was in my little corner meeting with God and Monica came up and, and she looked pretty perturbed and I said what is going on but sis and she said Papa we've got a problem and I said what is it or she said it's Lula I said what is it about Lula she said Lula never slept last night I said, what do you mean, Monica? She said, Lula went through the night. I said, how do you know that? She said, she was next to me. And, and she said, her face would be in the pillow like that. And, and she was just weeping and weeping right through the night. And the pillow was wet. And then she turned her face like this, and weeping right through the night. And then she turned the pillow over. I thought, oh, my wife's poor pillow, you know. What's <laughs> going on? And uh, I said, what do you think? He said, Papa, you're going to need to talk to her. And I said, go and get her. And she got her. And she came and sat in front of me with Monica. 
And I said, Lula, how are you doing? And the eyes were all swollen up because of the tears. I said, what is going on? And she said, Gerard, you spoke last night. I said, yeah. She said, you made two statements. Hmm. I said, what was it? She said, you said, my life is so important to God. If I'm the only person on the whole of this planet, Jesus Christ who would have come and died for me. She said, did you mean that? I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I said, I wouldn't say it if I don't mean it. And then she said, you said something else. I said, what did I say? She said, you said, it will cost me more to miss the will of God for my life and it will cost me to find it. She said, you meant that, didn't you? I said, I absolutely meant it. Mm -hmm. She came and stood close to me and she said, do you think Jesus could save me? Mm -hmm. On Christmas morning, she could save me. Mm -hmm. You see, there is a place we know not where, there is a time we know not when. It seals the destiny of men. If you are in the service this morning, you've never been saved, don't you go out of the door. Because the same sun that is suffering the butter is the sun that's hard in the clay. You don't know if God can speak to you again. You don't know. Hmm. Let me go a step further. Most of us who sit here this morning, we are Christians. <laughs> you see, what happened to me when I became a Christian? Well, listen to the Apostle Paul. He said, after Ephesians chapter 1, he said, after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance. He said, by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of your own. It's the grace of God. He said in Romans chapter 8 that the Spirit of God bear witness of my spirit that I'm a child of God. So now, brother and sister, here's the amazing thing. When you and I became a Christian, we received the Holy Spirit. Now let me clarify something to you. You see the Holy Spirit, when we say the Holy Spirit is a person, that means when I receive the Holy Spirit, I didn't receive a little part of the Holy Spirit because you can't cut personality into pieces. You can't do that. So you receive the Holy Spirit into your life. He's in your life. But you know what is the problem? He's resident. And yet he's not president. Mm. There are areas of our lives that we've never surrendered to him. Those of us who are here husbands this morning, my brother, can I ask you a question? Have you laid your wife on the altar for God? You can't do the work of the Holy Spirit in his life or in her life. My sister, can I ask you if you laid your husband on the altar for God? <laughs> Have you given your children to God? You know, we say the earlier on, <clears throat> When we pray, God didn't give us children to pop in and help, you know. No, no, no. He's given us children so that they would walk with God. But you can't do the work of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. See, so see, what needs to happen? Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Oh, I love this. Listen, can you imagine the Jew of the Old Testament? Here is the sacredness of the tabernacle. Here is the worship system of the people of Israel. Here is the, um, here is the ministry of the priests. And here are the Israelites. <clears throat> and here is this Jew. And he said, I'm going to bring, I'm going to come and bring an offering. And I'm going to bring one of my lambs. And 
and then he walks amongst his sheep and, and here he said it on lamp and the thing is crippled and it's sick and the thing is and it's gonna die, it's not gonna make it. And he said, Okay, I, I'm just gonna take this one and, and I'm gonna bring it to the priest and he's gonna sacrifice it and he's gonna shed the blood for my sins and for my iniquities and he will do that. He will never ever do that. Shoot. He will go amongst him and and find the very best one that he can ever find. And, and then he will bring it. And it's the most sacred little one. And, and then he's going to bring it. And he's going to bring it to the tabernacle. And, and then they're going to sacrifice the lamb for his sin. And it will be the best. And you sit here this morning as a Christian. And there are areas of your Christian life where you God, who are giving God the worst of I mean, how dare you do it? You see, what do I have to give? I have to give everything. You say, what is it going to cost me? It's going to cost you everything. It's my life and it's relationships. It's my heart and it's affection. It's my body and its instincts. It's my mind and its thoughts. It's my personality and its prejudices. I need to be abandoned to God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's everything or nothing. Do you know how we're going to see a church that will be full of people, that will be full of God? And you need to know God has given me a love for this. You know, little Andrew and honey, I so deeply care and love for them and these two beautiful children. And you better thank God that he has allowed this little pastor to, I shouldn't say little, you know. <laughs> you know Dynamite comes in small packets and watch it anyway, you know. But, you know, I, I remember the first time when I saw him, it was in youth that are, and, uh, you know, I, I saw this thing coming and I, I look at this thing. I saw him coming and, and I said to you, I said to the pastor, this is the God. Oh, he said, he's my youth pastor. And I nearly thought, can any good thing come out of Israel? You know? <laughs> no, I didn't. These people, these people are got a secret call. And ministry could be lonely, you know. Most mm -hmm. of, of, of you are seniors here, and it's the same with our youth pastor. I mean, the guy's in his 70s, but it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same with Pastor Sterling. He and I has got this thing that we want to do one day. We want to go fly fishing. And I told him last night, I go in the lake surrounded and grisly country and, and, and I, I sit there and it takes me uh, hours to find out where, where the fish is and hours to find out what, what they are taking and, and once I know where they are and what time it is, I just harass them hour after hour, you know. And I said, Sterling, you will believe us. When I sit in that lake, I said, I listen through the, act, for the, through the New Testament on, on audio every week when I'm there. And I said, you wouldn't believe how many, you wouldn't believe how many fish I caught in the book of Acts, you know. You should see him, he's sitting here, and he's in his 90s, you know, and he's like, I can't wait to fish with Gerard. Oh, dear, don't record that. <laughs> but let me ask you a question this morning. Most of us who are seniors, have you got a little prayer list? Are you praying for your pastor and his wife, children every day? You praying for the youth pastor, his wife, children every day? Sterling and Pastor Sterling and his wife, anyone else who's in leadership? Surrender to God. You know what, uh, and our time is gone. I was in the place some time ago and my wife's broke and it is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try and bring this thing down. You see, 
The Holy Spirit is a person. And Jesus turned to them and he said to them, You shall receive power when my spirit will come upon you. Mm -hmm. Let me talk to you about this word power. You see, it's the Greek word dunamis. And the word dunamis is found in 119 places in the New Testament. And brother and sister, in our translation of the Bible, this word dunamis has 16 different meanings. 16. So when Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. One of those meanings of those words is, it, it will be power to live right 24 hours a day. Hmm. Do not miss. It will be power to do something for God. You see, what are you talking about? Let me try to explain to you. You remember in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talked about the parable of the talents. And as he spoke about the parable of the talents, he made this statement. You see, he gave them talents according to their several ability. You know what's that word, ability? It's the Greek word, dunamis. You see, every one of us that sits in this church this Sunday morning, every single one of us, we are the ministry that God has given to us. My sister, my brother, those of us, we were just in a Sunday school class, and I challenged the people, I said, what are you going to do if God will separate you unto a ministry of intercessory prayer, and He's going to wake you up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and, and suddenly the burden of God is going to be there, and He's going to cause you to pray. You see, all of us, you, you're not the passenger in the bus, you know. I mean, if you want to be a passenger in the bus, don't be part of this church. You're not going to be a help, you're going to be a hindrance. So God has given us talents. I was in Chicago some time ago and I was reading about this elderly man in his 70s and God got a hold of his life in his 70s, you know. You can meet with God even in your older years. And God got a hold of his life. And he said, God, what do you want me to do? I can't preach. I can't stand up. I can't do all these things. And he prayed and prayed. And God laid it up on his heart and said, I tell you what you do. You just get bundles and bundles of Christian gospel tracts. And you're going to stand at the corner of the street in Chicago. And he said, you pray about those tracks. And then if someone comes by, you stand there with a track. And you're just in a very lovely way. He said, can I give you something to read today? And that's, that became his ministry. And he was so broken before God, you know. The atmosphere that we carry with us. It's an explanation of the way that people react to us. And he would stand there and people pass by him. He said, can I give you something to read? And when he was so nice, they never threw the tracks away. And one day he was walking to his house. And as he was walking towards his house, brother and sister, God spoke to him in his heart. This little inner voice of his conscience said, I want you to go to that house. And, and he said, Oh no, I can't do that. And he mm -hmm. kept walking. And as he walked, God spoke to him again and said, I want you to go to that house. And he said, I can't do it. And the third time when God spoke to him, he turned around, he was so convicted, and he had these tracks with him. And he turned around and he, he came to this house and he knocked at the door of the house and he began to knock. And guess what? No one opened the door. <laughs> and the seventh time that he knocked, he heard these loud footsteps and and someone just swinged the door open. He has this guy, the guy is standing and he's looking at him. And, and as he looked at me, he said, what is it, what do you want? And, and he said, sir, he said, I'm sorry. I just want to give you something to read. The man grabbed it and slammed the door in. The old little guy went back to his house and he's got on his knees. He said, you spoke to me, God, and I did it. <laughs> he probably said, don't do it again. Do it again. <laughs> and I did it. Listen. Two weeks later, he passed the house again. And as he passed the house again, God spoke to him and said, Why don't you go back to the house? <laughs> he said, oh, no. <laughs> he went back into the house, back to the house, knocked at the door, and the door just swing open. And this is man standing. He looked at him and he said, Why? Wow, it's you. Hmm. He said, Come in. Took him to the kitchen. He said, two weeks ago, I was standing in that box. 
You see that beam? There was a rope around that beam. I had a rope around my neck. I was going to take my own life. And he said, you began to knock at the door of my house. And I said, I'm not going to go home. And he said, you kept knocking. And after the seventh time that you knocked, he said, I took this rope off and I came and I walked. And I grabbed the strap and he said, I came back and I sat in this box. And I read this. And he said, I got on my knees. And I said, Jesus Christ, if you could save me, save me now. And he said, I could save you. Thank you, Jesus. Do you realize how important your life is to God? You can't be a passenger in the bus. And I have a sense in my heart, you know, that the time has come for us as a church to take a different direction. I don't know the history of this church, but listen, I could be a fool, but I'm not stupid. You've maybe gone through troubled waters in the last number of years. God brought his young pastor and his wife and his other staff members. And I was wondering this morning, God, why did you allow me to come to this place? And it kept coming. Maybe we have come together, we've come together to pray. This has been a weekend of prayer for me. This is maybe possible that you're going to give birth to something new. You're going to raise some people to seek my face. You're going to fill this place with people that are hungry for God. You're going to regulate the traffic. Bring the right ones in and get the wrong ones out. Because you said my house should become a house of prayer. Mm. If I challenge you this morning, what are you going to do? 